Good morning and welcome to FPC Monrovia's online service. This morning is Communion Sunday. Please prepare your bread and cups so that we can receive the Lord's Supper together. Also, we will be meeting today at 4 p.m. on the patio for our worship. Our uh, prayer on the pavement has moved from 6 p.m. to 4 p.m. We are still collecting baskets of blessings items. If you have non-perishable items that you would like to donate, you can turn those in at the church office. You can bring them with you this afternoon when we meet together at 4 p.m. so that we can reach out to the community for anybody that we um, can help that's in need. Um, and lastly, if you have prayer requests, please go online. We have a spot online that you can put your prayer requests on. Uh, they will be t submitted to our prayer team where we um, will pray over them for you. Thank you so much. Hello. Today's unison reading comes from 1 Peter 3, 8, 13 through 18. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, Love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Let's pray. God, I pray for those who feel overwhelmed, for those who feel that the responsibilities and the hardships that they have have gotten to be just too much. God, may they place their burdens on you and find rest. God, I pray for all of those who feel frustrated and restless, for all those who just want to move and get out or feel trapped right now. 
God, may they find a peace that surpasses all understanding in you. I pray for all those who feel defeated, for those who feel that they have just faced loss after loss, failure after failure, difficulty after difficulty. God, would they find their hope and a victory in you. I pray for those who feel uncertain, for those who don't know what the best, what the future will bring, what they should do, what choice will be best. God, would you give them clarity and lead them into wisdom and understanding. God, I pray for all those who feel lonely, those people who desperately wanna see their friends and loved ones, those who ache to be near people again, to be known and loved by others. God, would you shower them with your love and presence? God, I pray for the sick, the mourning, the hurting, the hungry, the cold, the fearful, the exhausted. You are near the brokenhearted. May we all feel your compassion, your grace, your love. You love each of us more than we could know or imagine. May we be filled and satisfied in your abundant love. Amen. Now let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now we will go into our time of offering. This is a time for you to reflect on the ways that God may be calling to you, you to give, whether that is financially, time, more time in prayer, more time giving, more time giving to your neighbor, more time in kindness. Whatever way God is calling you, would you feel that call as we reflect together? Amen.
bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day and for everything you give us. And as we enter November, this month of thankfulness, we pray that you just keep us reminded that we have so much to be thankful for, like the roofs over our head and the food we're able to eat. And please help us remember that not everyone is as fortunate as we are and that we continue to give back to those less fortunate. And we thank you for this virtual place where we can all worship you. And we pray that we have a great week and keep our minds and hearts focused on you. Amen. Good morning, church family. Welcome to worship and welcome to this opportunity that we have to uh, look at God's word. And so this morning we're looking at uh, Acts chapter 23 and verse 11. And just in this one verse, there is a statement that, uh, and for the sermon I've entitled it, the Lord has plans. And you know that you and I make plans all the time. And so we usually like to, in those plans, put the, the various segments and sections of the plans together and look at how much time it's going to take and see how we're going to be able to get from A to B or A to B and B to C. Uh, but anyway, how long is it going to take and where are the stops along the way? But with our plans, as the saying goes and the statement is, is that if you want to make God smile, uh, put your plans together and uh, share them with God. And then, of course, uh, the understanding there is God's in charge. God has a plan for your life and for my life, just as he had a plan for the Apostle Paul that we'll be reading about here in Acts 23 as well. Now, some of the plans that you and I make, of course, I, I think of vacation plans, and so sometimes we have a destination and I know at one time there was a trip that we were taking as a family that uh, driving from Colorado back to Pennsylvania and uh, a lot of states involved there. And I remember we got to the uh, uh, western edge of Kansas and one of the kids in the car, you know, said to me, so where are we, Dad? Uh, and where are we going? And I said, well, you know what? We're just about ready to enter into Kansas. And so God's going to show us Kansas for a while. Well, it was uh, the humorous thing is hours later, uh, the, uh, that same child uh, woke up from uh, a nap they were taking and sound, had been sound asleep for a number of hours. And they looked up and they said, Dad, where are we? And I said, well, we're still in Kansas. The next question from that child was, Dad, when is God going to stop showing us Kansas? <laughs> and, and so sometimes we have that question too, don't we, in our various lives and and the circumstances and situations as all we're trying to do is make it from A to B, from here to there. And there are sometimes uh, uh, things and situations, uh, circumstances that occur that make it feel like instead of a straight line from A to B is that it seems and feels a lot more like a circle or a, secure, a circuitous type route. In fact, in a Bible study this past week, as we were talking about the book of Acts and we were talking about the life of the Apostle Paul, uh, uh, there was a reference one of the uh, friends made in that Bible study that says, uh, and, and was basically God's will, as opposed to being a straight line from A to B, is very often uh, the shortest distance in a plan from God is a circle. Uh, and is more of a circuitous route and includes a lot of situations uh, that maybe we really hadn't thought about or planned. And so whenever we're on a trip, 
We very often think in the positive side of mountain climbing, lake fishing, river rafting, and so we're making these stops you know, here and there on our travels back from Colorado or from Los Angeles to Pennsylvania. And so we might even make a stop and, and go further north to uh, see Mount Rushmore. Uh, and if we were traveling from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia, you certainly would want to stop and uh, be able to see Gettysburg if you've never stopped there before. Uh, and then, of course, along the way in our travels, there'd be presidential libraries, national parks, uh, and traveling north along the uh, highway in the state of California, you've got the beaches. I uh, remember we stopped to see the elephant seals uh, near Cambria. And uh, there's wineries, uh, there's the visit over to Universal Studios. I mean, the, the positive side of these trips. Uh, so, that, yeah, traveling from here to there in a straight line just isn't going to be a part of it. You know, on the negative side, unfortunately, you know, during our lives and our life journey, if we're looking to go in a straight line here from A to B throughout the life without any interruptions, well, that's not going to be the case, is it? Uh, we all know that there are going to be crises, there's going to be detours, roadblocks, uh, the under construction signs, you know, be patient with me because God isn't finished yet. There's going to be accidents, circumstances, pandemics, calamities, uh, and even illnesses that, uh, again, disrupt our lives and bring perhaps things to a halt. And then we have to make adjustments. So for the Apostle Paul as well. Uh, we look at Acts chapter 23, verse 11. Notice Paul has a plan in Acts 19, in verse 21, where Paul is in Ephesus. And when he's in Ephesus and he's about ready to finish up his ministry there, he has a plan. And his plan is to go to Jerusalem and then he wants to go to visit Rome. Well, he goes uh, to Jerusalem, he makes it to Jerusalem according to his plan. And while there, uh, he's having difficulties, challenges, struggles. He's in trouble with the city of Jerusalem and the Jews who were there. Uh, and they're frustrated and upset with him uh, because of what he is teaching to the Gentiles. Uh, as Jesus has called him to go to the Gentile world and communicate the good news. Well, the Jews and the, the church in Jerusalem, frankly, uh, they're really frustrated with the Apostle Paul and uh, his theology and his preaching. But there he is in Acts 23, and he has been arrested and taken into uh, uh, the care of uh, the Roman tribunal. In fact, the Roman system, the Roman uh, role of justice, and uh, Paul finds himself in the barracks uh, of Roman soldiers. And he's being taken care of and protected from, of all people, uh, the Jews uh, and the Christian Jews, the church, because they're wanting to uh, persecute and punish him for his failure to align himself with the teachings that they felt uh, were absolutely essential and necessary. But in verse 11, the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem. So you must also testify in Rome. You see, when the Apostle Paul left Ephesus, he was anticipating when he arrived in Jerusalem that he would receive a warm reception and welcome. You remember Acts 15, uh, there was this moment of the Jerusalem Council and reviewing the fact that Paul had a call from Jesus Christ to go to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles were responding uh, with great enthusiasm and uh, numbers in coming to embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And, but yet the church in Jerusalem was very concerned and about the theology and the teachings and the expectations that the body and legalistic traits of Judaism must be embraced by this Gentile world if they truly were going to be uh, the children and the family of faith. However, the Jerusalem Council made a decision 
to make allowances for and to lower again the, the intensity of requirements placed upon the Gentile churches and the Gentiles who were coming to faith. And so the Apostle Paul was anticipating that he would receive a warmer reception, even though he had been, uh, again, subject to a lot of discrimination and persecution, uh, even in Ephesus. And so when he came there, what did he find? Unfortunately, more persecution, more difficulties, more circumstances, more situations and challenges that uh, God was allowing for him to experience. And so instead of being free and in a joyful time, the Apostle Paul finds himself under the care and the protection of the Roman tribunal. But as Paul is in those barracks, perhaps discouraged uh, and frustrated, he hears this statement coming from the Lord who stood near to him and said, Paul, take courage. And that Greek word and phrase is actually the same word that Jesus uses in John 16 when Jesus said, Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And so here Jesus is saying to Paul, Take courage, or be of good cheer, Paul. You have been faithful in your ministry and your testimony to the people here in Jerusalem. And I want you to know as well, is that you will be testifying about me in Rome. So Paul was able to take great courage uh, and encouragement from that statement. The statement of the Lord was, that was giving him, a, in a sense, a future look at uh, the fulfillment uh, of his wish, uh, in a sense of his bucket list, to be able to go on to Rome, the, the capital city of the largest empire of the known world at that time, uh, the, the Roman Empire. And he was going to be able to go there and communicate the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so from here to there now was being promised to Paul. But what Paul didn't realize is that the circuitous route, in a sense the circular plan, that in the meantime, Paul was going to be confronted with opportunities, let's say, uh, or challenges to testify uh, before the court of the governor Felix in Caesarea. And he was going to be able to be uh, then testify a number of times about his faith in Jesus Christ, his participation in what was known as uh, the church at that time, referred to as the way in following the Nazarene Jesus Christ and accomplishing Jesus' role and function uh, in communicating the gospel. So as the Apostle Paul had communicated in Jerusalem, he had gone to Antioch, Paul had been up to Ephesus, he had been in Corinth, he had traveled to Athens. In fact, he had completed three missionary journeys. Uh, and a quick look here at Paul's uh, Christian life. His conversion occurred in 33 AD. His missionary journeys, and there were three of them, went from 46 AD to about 57 AD. And then in uh, at the time we're looking at now here in Acts 23 is that uh, we have uh, the situation where it's 57 AD and the Apostle Paul is in Jerusalem. Well, as he was moved then to Caesarea uh, because there was an assassination uh, plot that was uh, being put together by 40 uh, Jews in the city of Jerusalem and the Romans heard about it while well, they scooped up Paul and along with about uh, 400 soldiers uh, they made sure that the, the Apostle Paul uh, because he was also a Roman citizen and he used that citizenship to be able to again be escorted on to uh, Herod's uh, castle uh, Herod's palace in the city of Caesarea which is right along uh, the uh, Mediterranean waterfront there. Uh, in today's world, that would be uh, Tel Aviv, which is, uh, again, uh, west of, uh, of Jerusalem. And so then, as Paul then made his way to Rome, it would have been in 64 AD 
uh, about 30, 31, 32 years after he had come to know Christ in a personal and uh, vital, vigorous way, is that Paul was martyred in Rome. And of course, in AD 64 was when uh, Nero was the emperor uh, in Rome. And uh, Nero, as you know, was uh, certainly a, 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 a tyrant and a dictator uh, and a cruel individual. And so there were these fires that had begun and for which uh, Nero was blamed for starting these fires in Rome. Uh, but then uh, Nero uh, blamed, them, uh, blamed the fires and the difficulties that Rome, the city of Rome was having uh, on Christians. And so the Christians then endured a severe persecution at the time. So God has plans for your life and for mine. And he had plans for the apostle Paul uh, to get him from A to B, from Jerusalem to Rome. But in the meantime, in the midst of those plans, the Apostle Paul was going to serve as a witness for the Lord Jesus. And so God had the plan that Paul would be communicating uh, the gospel to Festus uh, uh, and then also to Felix. Uh, of Rome. These are Roman governors, Roman leaders. And then to King Agrippa, who was king of Judea at that particular time. And the interesting thing, as we read in these chapters from Acts 23 on through the end of the book of Acts in Acts 28, is that uh, they also brought in family members. Their, their wives came along and they wanted their wives uh, to hear the Apostle Paul speak about the way and to speak about this Nazarene who he followed. Uh, and Paul spoke to them then of his experience of Jesus appearing to him and spoke uh, to them of Jesus coming to fulfill, the God, to fulfill the Old Testament and the promises of God and how this Jesus was crucified and dead and buried, but then resurrected from the dead and now was alive forevermore and that they too could receive this Jesus. So God was giving uh, the apostle Paul this opportunity to communicate uh, the good news of Jesus Christ uh, to people at the highest levels of the Roman empire and the Roman government. And so you see, God has his plans. We have our plans. The apostle Paul had his vision on going to Rome uh, and Jesus said, well, yes, you're going to go to Rome. And so that was a kernel of promise that the Apostle Paul, in the midst of all of this distraction and perhaps disruption, it was a promise that God had given to him and he was able to hold on to that. However, when it comes to God's making his plans, I think of uh, some passages in Proverbs. For example, Proverbs 16, we read, Commit yourself to the Lord in whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. In their human hearts, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. And so in Proverbs 16, yes, commit to the Lord whatever you do. That is, run your plans by God, and God will look over those plans. And after reviewing them, then he will establish your plans. Uh, and so as well in that Proverbs, it talks about the fact that in our own hearts, we plan our course. But in the end, of course, it is the Lord who establishes our steps. Proverbs 19 underscores the same message. He says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purposes that prevail. And we look at Romans 8 and we take this and put this alongside of Romans 8 where it says that uh, all things work together for God's good in order to accomplish uh, what is taking place in a person's life. All things work together for God's good and according to God's plan. And so as we look at life history and life events, we have to stop and remember that it is God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. It is God who raises up kings uh, as well as brings empires down. 
uh, and it is God who is overseeing all of that is happening and occurring. And of course, this is very relevant uh, in our time and day and age for our country, isn't it? In the midst of an election, and we're wondering, okay, who is going to be the next president? Uh, what about the Senate? What about the Congress? Uh, what about the pandemic? And what are the plans? And how long will this last? There's a lot of unknowns, aren't there? There's a lot going on in God's mind that God knows, but we're not being included in that discussion. We pray and we ask for God's best. We ask for God's grace. And God is abundant in his goodness to you and to me. He is faithful in his presence. Wherever we are, he is there with us. Jesus reminds us at the end of Matthew chapter 28, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so what is God's plan for us? What is a clear statement in Scripture? Uh, as we recall, when we really want to know what God's plan is for our lives, uh, it's the Scripture that we must go and we must submit and surrender to uh, Scripture's teaching and be led and guided by it. And so as we uh, em embrace uh, the Scriptures, as we embrace God's plan, we know that God has His love and His care for us. His grace is plentiful. And we know that one of the key verses that I would quote from in terms of what is God's plan for you and for me, well, in Matthew chapter 6, it says, Seek ye first, seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness, and all of the things of life uh, will take care of themselves. And so what is God's expectation then for you and for me? What was his expectation of the Apostle Paul? His expectation and his plan for the Apostle Paul was that he would follow God's will. He would uh, submit and acknowledge and obey the Lord in all that he did and all that he said. And that same expectation is for you and for me as well. God's expectation for you and for me is that we would be faithful. Faithful in our daily lives, faithful to our spouses, faithful to our families, faithful to our friends, uh, faithful to our callings, uh, and faithful in our obedience to be the best that we can possibly be in accordance with the qualities, characteristics, and life that God has given to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we submit and yield and ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit to come and guide and direct our steps in carrying out God's plan for us. And so we need to remember as well is that the Apostle Paul in his calling all the way back to the beginning of his conversion experience in 33 AD, you remember that Jesus gave, in a sense, a statement to the Apostle Paul, and it certainly was fulfilled for our brother Paul. Uh, it says that, remember the words of Jesus, it says, but the Lord said to Ananias, remember Paul was knocked off his horse, as it were, uh, was brought to his knees on his road to Damascus as he was going to persecute, and he had letters of authority uh, from uh, the Sanhedrin. Uh, in Jerusalem to begin to again collect and gather uh, followers of the way, uh, followers of, the, of Jesus Christ and begin to persecute them as well as uh, to bring them to death, to execute them. And so on the way to Damascus, Jesus appears to Paul and brings him to his knees and it's the conversion of the Apostle Paul that takes place. And then as Paul goes into Damascus and he's waiting for further instruction, the Lord says to Ananias, the Lord uses Ananias as a messenger, and he says, go tell Paul uh, that he is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name, uh, my good news to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. The Apostle Paul certainly found that out, didn't he? Uh, as numerous times, he found himself being beaten up or persecuted or thrown into prison. And on one, one occasion, he was stoned and thrown outside, I believe it was the city of Philippi, uh, and left for dead. But yet God raised him up. 
Uh, on uh, five different occasions, he was flogged uh, with the cat of nine tails, just as Jesus received that same beating. Uh, it was uh, considered 40 times minus one, that is 39 lashes uh, on five different occasions, and the Apostle Paul survived uh, that situation. And so God gives to you and to me his strength, his presence, his care. And even though it may seem that the difficulties we're going through, uh, we're not going to be able to uh, handle. Uh, we're told by the Apostle Paul, we're told by the Scripture that God will not give us more than we're able to handle. And yet in some of these times and struggles and difficulties, uh, we ask the question of God, you know, I know you're not going to test me or give me more than I can handle, but it sure seems that you have a lot more expectation uh, and belief in me than I have in myself. But yet we're told that through Jesus Christ, all things are possible. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So day in and day out, as we seek and we seek out to live, uh, the will of God and we want to know what God's plan is we first of all must stop and we pray and we say Lord what is your plan for my life and my situation and circumstances help me to understand Lord come and be with me be alongside of me give me and my loved ones the kind of peace and assurance that we need in order to be able to make it through uh, these times of difficulty and stress uh, or illness or challenge and the promise again of Jesus Christ lo I am with you always even to the end of the age the Lord's plan is clear and certain he knows that he holds the future and the one who holds the future also holds you and me Isaiah 40 makes it very very clear that God loves his lambs and he carries them close to his heart. That's who we are in the arms of the shepherd being carried on to the destinations and through the will, uh, through the circumstances and through the challenges of life from here to there under the love and in the love and embrace of the Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we come to this time in our time of worship to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. The Lord's Supper is very often referred to as a Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. A thanksgiving for all that God has done for us through Jesus Christ, His Son, our Savior and Lord, and what God accomplished and achieved through Jesus in His ministry. And then finally, in his sacrifice, his sacrifice as he died on the cross for the sins of the world, for your sins and for mine. The Apostle Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says that, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, we are a new creation. And the old is gone, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and now has given to us, to you and to me, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was reconciling the world to himself through and in Christ, not counting our sins against us. But he has committed to us now this message of reconciliation, this good news, this meal, as well as this news of thanksgiving. So therefore we are Christ's ambassadors now, as though God were making his appeal then through you and through me. So Paul writes that he implores us on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God, to receive this salvation and this gift of God's grace. So God made him who knew no sin to be made and to become sin so that we might become 
the righteousness of God. Paul says in another place that he who was rich, that is rich in righteousness, became poor, that is became sin, so that you and I might become flourishing and rich disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want you to take a, a moment, if you haven't come prepared uh, with your bread and your cup, and uh, just take a moment. And while you are getting some of that bread uh, and a cup, I'm going to offer a prayer of thanksgiving. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord and God, how grateful we are for uh, your goodness to us, your patience with us. We ask, O oh Lord, now that you would bless this bread and this cup so that we might receive them, be nourished and nurtured by them, so that we might be able to remember again with great thanksgiving and the commitment and devotion, dedication of our lives to you as we receive these elements. As you have taken these ordinary elements, O oh Lord, and you have consecrated and set them apart, for our sanctification and for our increase as your loving disciples. Anytime we sit, O oh Lord, with bread and with beverage, with a cup, may we always be thinking, O oh Lord, and remember of your great sacrifice and that in you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are indeed new creations blessed with the opportunity to participate in communicating the good news of Jesus Christ to the world around us. We offer ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to this table, as we come to this bread, as well as to this cup, we remember that the Lord's table is prepared by the Lord, and you and I are invited to participate in His grace through our faith. And so we remember and recall that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, He took the bread, and after He had blessed it, He broke it. And He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. And in the same way, after supper, our Lord took the cup and he said to his disciples, he says to you and to me, this cup is the blood of Jesus Christ. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. It represents the love of God poured out for you and me and for our salvation. And Jesus said, take this cup, remember my sacrifice, and drink ye all of it. And so we drink this cup now together, remembering the Lord's death for the forgiveness of our sin. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God for your grace, for your salvation, for our deliverance. In Jesus' name, amen.
Church family, this morning we've been looking at the fact that God has plans for us. The Lord had plans for the Apostle Paul. The Lord has plans for you and for me. He's called us to be his witnesses. He's called us in his love to gather as his children, as sisters and brothers together. As we conclude our service this morning, I bring these words of encouragement from Romans chapter 12 to you and to me. And here the Apostle Paul wrote, he said, let love be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in enthusiasm, but keep your spiritual fervor when serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. And let us live in harmony with one another. All in the power of the Holy Spirit. For the glory of God. And in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless us. May the Lord keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us. And may the Lord continue, as always, to be faithful and gracious to us and grant us peace and healing in these difficult and trying days. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.